Okay, I understand that I was doing my slides wrong last time, so I'm going to try to get caught up, but the technology is a little befuddling to me. I will tell you that um, we have had, technology and I are not, not friends right now. <laughs> I have websites that are Bible teaching websites. Great Commission Bible Institute operates entirely online. That, um, that website has been hacked seven times in the last 48 hours by a group called Free Palestine, and they have made me their pet. And uh, I appreciate your prayers. My wandering shepherd, so our, our church site was so obliterated that we had to recreate it a week ago. This has been going on for seven months, and uh, we've been up and down. I have people all the way, I have people from Google that are mad. Never get Google mad. They, um, because Ali Reza, the Hezbollah group, put on my site in Arabic something that translates like this. Teach all the Bible you want, we will win. And Google said, we're not even Christians, but we don't like to be threatened. <laughs> so <laughs> it's an interesting thing going on in my life right now. It's been going on night and day. And so um, the site in which I put most of my Bible teaching up is about 4,700 pages right now of Bible teaching. And that is all available free. And that's, um, you Google The Wandering Shepherd. It's actually my name is the actual domain, randalldsmith.com. But uh, if you want to remember it, people Google The Wandering Shepherd. And if you, if you open it up and there happens to be an Arabic song and some Arabic writing, that means we're hacked. But give us an hour, we'll be back up. Um, I have IT people from California to Florida working on this. And I'm telling you that we don't know how they're doing it. Um, four different companies, four different platforms. They've managed actually to even get my Gmail shut down. And the way they did it was 70,000 spams in one hour sent to my box. They shut it down. Um, 21 kids gave their heart to Jesus Christ yesterday. So my one office was sitting there grabbing their hair in despair, and the other office was rejoicing. And I was walking around going, well, isn't this fun? <laughs> you know? So, all right, let's, I, I think I understand how this works now. I was looking at the wrong, of the wrong screen of the two. So let me see if I can get this to be. I want to talk now about the man and message of Ezekiel. And in our second session, I want to be able to introduce some captivity characters to you. There are a couple of things that we need to be able to do. So... One of the things we're going to do is introduce the captivity characters. Then we also want to give you a quick overview of what the book of Ezekiel is about. So we start to get, stop circling around the book and start getting into it. I'm very excited about that. Then I want to challenge you with something, the, the vision that started the book in chapters 1, 2, and 3, and see if I can help you to understand why it was important that God grabbed the heart of a guy and showed him who he was. Because Ezekiel's not like any other prophet in the Bible. He is commanded to stand up, you're going to love this, in the face of many more popular preachers and tell the truth. What they're telling you is a lie. Yay. And that's what he had to do. And that's not an easy thing to do. And so we want to take a look very much closely at the, the profound vision of God's glory. If there is a theme to the book, it is the marvelous glory of God. <coughs> Falling before the marvelous glory of God. Now, let's stop for a minute and talk about the captivity period. A young lady told me a story about her mother. Uh, she and her mother had gone out to the store. They'd been gone a couple hours because they walked into a store thinking they needed a few things and ended up with a few carts, and some of you have been through that. And so they took a long time, and when they got back home, they walked up, and uh, the door was locked, and Mom had forgotten her house key. So they began knocking on the door, and they're knocking, and they're knocking. The son is inside, the father's inside, nobody's coming out. So they noticed that the upstairs bedroom had the flickering light of a television set in the parents' room, so they started calling, Dad! Dad! And Dad doesn't get up. So they decided 
that they, neither of them had their cell phone on them. So they went down to the local Quickie Mart, went in and said, can we use your phone? We're trying to get in our house and nobody's waking up. Called the phone, the son woke up, and the son said, all right, come on, I'll be standing here. And they went five minutes back to the house. They show up, the son opens the door, helps them get all their bags in the house. After the bags are put away, Mama walks up to the bedroom. There's Dad lying there with a remote in his hand and the television's on. So she very quietly takes the remote out of his hand, puts it on the table, walks over, shuts off the TV, to which Dad wakes up and says, What'd you turn that off for? I'm watching it. Now, I tell you this story not because you've ever been through it and not because I'm doing any counseling for anyone today. I tell you that story because I get the feeling that that's where the church is right now. That there's an awful lot of guys who are sound asleep and they don't understand that trouble is coming and people are banging on the doors and they're looking for new relevant ways to tell something that will get a crowd to feel their itching ears were scratched. The problem is that's not going to help people when real trouble comes. I believe there's a biblical cause for me to conclude that the church is standing amidst the world that is screaming for help and many believers are snoring and a few are stuttering. I think one of the things we want to do as we open up the book of Ezekiel is see that one of the points that Ezekiel's call and writing makes that I think is unique is that it's, it's aimed at a time when the other prophets that are speaking are telling a lie. See, that's not always true. Ezekiel was called in the middle of a captivity to say and do the weirdest things in the Bible. Can we all just admit that? I mean, cooking on your human dung, this is not a normal thing God asks people to do. But there's a reason why the extremity of the message had to be said the way it was. Because in the middle of the exile, people were saying, Jerusalem is still operating, the temple is still operating, it's all going to be okay. Now, when you've been led away in 606 into captivity, it wasn't really that bad because Daniel rose to be a prime minister. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they actually had a pretty good pad. The education system was ongoing, and, and, and frankly, they were brought into a system where they could flourish pretty well along the Chabar River. When, when the second group came in in 597, they brought with them Ezekiel. And Ezekiel arrived there with, a, le with a, a letter, not he himself, but someone in the group, which is now Jeremiah 29. And they brought that letter saying, guys, God isn't done with our people yet, but here's what to do while you're in captivity, Jeremiah wrote. Marry off your kids to each other and pray for the ruler over your city so that you might be in peace and God will bring us back. What people took out of that was, hey, the end is near, it's going to be great, peace and prosperity are coming to us. And there was a priest who was 25 years old who was dragged out of Jerusalem after his training toward the priesthood. At what age does a priest begin to do his work? at the age of 30. So he is a 25-year-old guy when he's dragged off in 597 and he's brought with his wife. It is the wife of his youth. He's in love. He ends up at the Chabar River and it's not bad. Truthfully, he went to school. Truthfully, he could even continue to use the Hebrew language within the context of the school. He learned math. He learned science. He learned all kinds of new things. It was, a, it was an exciting environment, except for it wasn't home. So don't think the captivity was all chains and beatings. That's not really what it was. I want you to take this book and with all of its complexity, cut it into three parts. I, I want the first part of it in chapters one, two, and three to be 
the most fantastic exposure of the majestic God ever given in Scripture. You only have a couple places with the Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord. The, the, the Revelation 1, I saw Jesus in his resurrected state. Uh, Revelation 4 and 5, I saw the throne room of heaven. Ezekiel 1 to 3, I saw God's throne room. So the very beginning of this book will be the call of a prophet. And he's going to encounter God in a very profound way. And he's going to have to because he's going to have to speak truth to power and he's going to have to stand in opposition to stubborn and hardened hearts. The, the, the second part of the book I've got in two lines. It's really one thing, but it's split in a very unique way. The, the second part of the book is a seven-year period in his life. Five of those years he's preaching to the people of God who are estranged, and two of those years he's preaching to the nations which aren't listening to him. I always found it interesting that God called people to give messages, that the messenger had a profound message from God, and the receiver had no interest in listening. Let me just say that the story of the Bible is God doing the impossible through the unlikely. That's the whole story. And that in the midst of God doing the impossible through the unlikely, he often sends messages just at the time people are unwilling to hear them. I have raised teenagers. I don't have to go much further into that statement for you to apply what I just said. A lot of stuff that I said only became absolutely understood by them after they did exactly the opposite of what I told them to do. I now have the privilege of having my daughter and her husband and her baby in my house because they decided to do baby first, marriage second. We went over this only a thousand times. But now we're in the wonderful world of me parenting three people. And here's the reason I tell you that. What a privilege. I'm having the time of my life with a grandson. And he's in the bedroom. He's in my bedroom. But let me, show you, let me just say this. What God did was took my little girl who was healthy through a delivery who's now lying in a bed in pain with rheumatoid arthritis and unable to get up and for the first time listening to God. When you pray for your kids to hear God, pray for the pain that goes with it. Pray for the endurance to watch God work in the heart of your child. Remember, Sarah belongs to Jesus more than to me. I hate that. It's just true. And I watch this tender-hearted mama who's agonizing because her mother has to diaper her baby for her. And it breaks her heart. And it's our greatest privilege. Because if my daughter will turn her heart to Jesus Christ, I don't care what it costs. That's eternal, not temporal. Five years, God talked to the people of God. In chapters 4 through 24, he said, I want you guys to know I've got a problem with you. We're going to spend some time there because it's worth knowing what ticks off God that believers do all the time. By the way, he spent five years on believers, only two on the world. If it's not clear to you now, it ought to become clear to you. God has a higher standard and a different standard for the believer than he ever had for the world. And he expects us to behave because we've had a great deal more given to us. And unto whom much is given, much is therefore required. So, in chapters 4 to 24, there's the judgment against God's people. But then in 25 to 32, he spends a little bit of time saying, by the way, the world did get me ticked, I should tell you why. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time with that. That's the center section. So let's say there's a call with a judgment. The last part of that book, from 33 all the way to the end, some of you are already familiar with 40 to 48, which is a wonderful story about the temple, but, but from 33 to 48, something happened. Message came that the Jerusalem temple was destroyed. And when they were deeply wounded, and when they got it, that all the other voices that told them peace and prosperity were liars. When everybody told them, you send me a dollar, I'll get you ten, and all of a sudden the country was bankrupt, busted, and broke, God sent another message. You got nothing, and I love you. You're broke, and I love you. Your whole economic, emotional, 
spiritual system is destroyed. By the way, I love you. I'm going to do something. Now, what happens is that the book itself is laid out in those three simple parts. If you'll grab that, I think you can find some very, very important things. Now, Ezekiel is the minority report. And in some ways, Ezekiel is very, very much different than the other prophets of his time. In some ways, he's identical, but in some ways, he's, he's very, very different. How's he, how's he like other prophets? Well, remember, Daniel is the first of the prophets of the exilic period. He's taken away in 606, and he becomes prime minister. Not a bad gig. Dan actually flourished where he was. Did you know that we have 70 years of Dan's prophetic work? He's, he's got more coverage than practically any prophet in the Bible. 70 years of doing the work. And the problem with the book of Daniel is that it's not in chronological order, but it's an incredible book that has two parts to it, six chapters on a biography of how God shows light in darkness, and seven through 12 that shows the prophetic truths of God as they're unfolded. Very, very dramatically done. By the time Ezekiel gets there, though, the reputation of Daniel is known. Let's put it this way. If Daniel's in 606, the second wave comes up, and this will be Ezekiel's wave. Now, when Ezekiel comes, people have already gone to Babylon. It wasn't so bad. They got brochures back and said, hey, you can go to Babylon, and you can live as a Jew. You can marry your Jewish children to other Jewish children. It's not so terrible. But, but, but Zeke didn't feel that way. And the reason was he grew up to be a priest, and there's only one job a priest can do. And that's work in the temple. Ezekiel's unique in some very interesting ways. He gets views of the temple and the inside of what God is doing in a very, very interesting set of ways. Here's probably the biggest thing I want you to remember. I picked this up from Warren Wiersbe years ago, and I, I think it's well worth remembering. Ezekiel was called to do something very interesting. He was called to move from being a priest to being a prophet. Now, what's the difference? Well, I want you to think of a priest as a guy who's not an innovator. When you go to school, you get Levitical law and you learn it as a priest. Do you know how you're supposed to mix all of the parts of the incense? You're supposed to mix all the parts of the incense exactly the way the guy did it the day before you. You know how tomorrow it's going to be mixed? Exactly the way you do it today. Being a priest is about doing what you're told. It's about opening the doors. If, we, if, the, if the high priest says at 801 I want the doors open, then you don't think about it. At 801 you open the doors. If he says he wants the short Levites to stand on the right side of the Nicanor stairs when the song starts, then that's where they stand. Being a priest is about taking a series of instructions. Here's how you kill a goat. Here's how you pass the loins of the goat to the other priest without getting blood on you. You don't innovate it. You don't decide to create some cool little conveyor belt for the, for the goat. You just do it the way it's always been done. That's a priest. And by the way, they're pretty popular. Because priests had a function in ancient Hebrew society. You walked in estranged from God, and this guy actually helped you to, to have the abatement of God's wrath as the blood dripped out of the animal, and as that animal was placed up there on the grill, you knew that God was, was looking away from the wrath against your sin because you were doing what God told you to do. And by the way, the sacrifice never saved you. Your belief saved you. Lots of good goats died for nothing. Because the guy said, yeah, well, I'm killing the goat. What do you want? Your heart. God only ever, ever, ever wanted from human beings one thing, the surrender of their heart. Kill all the goats you want without a surrendered heart. All you did was make goat, goat barbecue, which isn't that good. And so in the end, the priest is just chunking it out. He's doing his job. Now, some of you have jobs like a priest job. You, you go in accounting. C can I just share with you, we do not want creative accountants. 
<laughs> Accounting is not one of those crafts we go, wow, does he do it differently? If he does it differently, we have a jail cell for people who do it that way. Accounting is about doing it right, not do it, doing it creatively. I keep saying this to my son. When I ask you to take the trash out, don't be creative, just be obedient. I don't need new ways to toss it over the hedge. Just walk it out like I showed you to do it and put it on the street. The guy coming by, he'll know what to do. Now, the problem is, Ezekiel has to move to being a prophet. Now, a priest walks down the street and he's got a costume. I, this is the thing that I miss in my fellowship. We don't get cool costumes. I think we need cool costumes and big hats. I just, I, I love that. <laughs> we don't get those, but, but he would walk down the street and everybody would go, priest, priest, get out of the way, priest. On the other hand, God was calling a priest to become a prophet. He's going to be despised and persecuted, not esteemed and loved. He's going to have to learn to do something. You have to understand, a prophet was supposed to engage God and then say whatever God said to say. That is so not a priest. That is so a different skill set. Can we just stop here and just, just recognize something? The call of God in your life might not be to lean into the natural character traits you have. You don't get to choose your call. God chooses your call. Do you know what I never find in Scripture? I never find in any part of the Scripture where God called a man and then asked him to invent a list of things that would make God happy. Noah! Noah! Yes, Lord? I'm thinking maybe you should build me something. What do you got? <laughs> See, the story of the Scripture is God knows what he wants. God makes a plan. We follow it. But I, 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 I'm going into seminars where churches are saying, we need to come up with a way to... Wait a minute. I thought that's what the book of Acts was. You don't have plans to make. You have paths to follow. And what you do is ask God to blow the leaves off the path so you can see which way it's going. The word is a lamp unto my feet. The problem is if you happen to have a foot lamp, they only give you about two feet of information before you need to move the lamp forward. You can't see very far into the future. That's a prophet. A prophet's somebody who listens to God. A prophet's somebody who has to give harsh words and suffer severe taunts and do whatever it takes. Now here's the problem. The problem is that false prophets are abounding in his day, and you've never been in a day like that, so you don't have to worry about it. But, but they, they were offering false hope and false compromise and false results. And so here's the thing. God opens up. Now you get to open your Bible, which makes me really feel good because I can't stand talking around it. Let me just, let me offer this. There are three parts to chapters 1, 2, and 3. Okay? In God's original call, the first part is seeing the majestic one. That's chapter 1. In other words... No man can serve God until they see God as God. The problem is, there are so many pulpits with people who have seen the Bible, but not God. Jesus said it. He said, you think in these words you'll find life? In me you find life. I'm a Bible teacher. I'm not trying to talk down and dis teaching the Bible. I'm trying to say that the end point is not so that you can win a Bible quiz. The... The point of reading the love letter is to fall in love with the person. And, and so chapter 1 says this incredible, majestic view of the person was necessary. And then in chapter 2, he had to be able to hear the word of the Lord. Because once you go, <gasps> come on, some of you did this. First time you saw the love of your life, you went, because <gasps> in high school, there were the people who were like on your level. You remember this? Then there were the people that, no way, I'm not dating that. And then there were the people like, no way, they're not dating me. And then you happened upon this one person whose eyesight failed them on that particular moment. They looked across the room, they saw you, and you went, oh, they're like up here, and they're looking at me, and now they're talking to me. 
Okay, that's great. Good beginning. Not a marriage, but it's a nice meeting. Now that you saw the majesty and glory of God, now you've got to learn to hear his voice. Because some people get caught on the experience of the majesty. And those are the people in our churches that end up worshiping worship, not worshiping God. They're caught up in the experience, but they miss the point. The spirit of, uh, the spirit of God is hooked like an umbilical cord back to the life of a believer. That umbilical cord severed in the garden was reattached in your salvation experience. But just remember this, even lost man has a soul and soul mimics spirit. I have been in Tel Aviv, in a square, with kids crying out, holding Bic lighters, going like this, desperate for the God of Abraham, and not one of them had the Spirit of God. Not one. But it looked like a Christian meeting. They were all Jews, and none of them knew, knew the Spirit of God at all. I've seen that the soul mimics the Spirit so well, you can't tell the difference. Spirit is about a connection to God. Soul is about the emotional connection to the connection. Now, what's interesting is in chapter 1, he saw God, and in chapter 2, he heard him, and then in chapter 3, then came the job. Then he got the call to be a prophetic watchman and to start looking. I want to take some time, and I want to look at the beginning of chapter 1. I'm only going to spend some time in chapter 1 to give a couple of basic requirements that are necessary for God to grab the heart, and I think it's terribly important that we do it. I want to look at preparation if I can. Look at the very beginning verse. It says, Now it came about in the 30th year, on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Habar among the exiles, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. The very first thing is that God waited until he was ready to serve him and to reveal great truths to him. So what's going on in his life? If I could write it this way, it was my 30th year, I was supposed to be a priest, I'm far from home, the temple's operating, I'm not there, and boy am I bummed. Because I was going to be a priest. I was going to know people. I was going to do it well. When it came to executing animals and handing that stuff, I was going to do it better than it had ever been done. And here I am stuck on the Habar River in this little place called Tel Aviv. Nice place, not a bad school, but I'm not doing what I was made to do. I was born to be a Kohen. I was born to be a priest. And there I was going, man, I miss being able to see the temple. I wish I could walk just for a minute inside that temple and, and see those cherubim and, and see the weavings as they held together and the, and the menorah and, and, the, and, and the, the beauty. Smell the baked bread that was on the table of showbread. I so wanted to be at that place, but I wasn't. It came about I was in my... My 30th year when I should have been graduating from my priest academy. In the recent Summer Olympic Games in 2012, Kim Rode won a gold medal in skeet shooting, making her the first American to win five Olympic gold medals in consecutive Olympic Games. In 2012, she hit 99 out of 100 skeet settings. That was a new Olympic record, and she tied the record for the whole event. New York Times came to her and said, how exactly did you get to be so proficient? Did you always know that you had this skill? And she said this, I shoot 500 to 1,000 rounds every single day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. To save you the math, she said, that's three million plus shots with a shotgun a year. And by the way, if you're calculating, that's 600,000 rounds per medal I've gotten. I started to think, wouldn't it be interesting to know how many Olympic medalists invested how many hours in their training? How many, how many other things did they reject? How many other opportunities to go to a movie did they say, no, I got to practice for? 
How many other times did they walk through a buffet line and go, nah, -uh, not on my calorie list? So my, my point is, serious achievements are seldom made haphazardly. There's a time for preparation, whether it's conscious or unconscious, on our part. And just remember that the training of God's people is always conscious in God's mind. So right now, some of you are going through trouble because you're about to get a university certificate of encouragement so that you can encourage other people when they go through trouble. And some believers are going to be running around trying to figure out if it's the devil or did they do something wrong. And some believers are going to try to tell you that you need to somehow discern why God has you in the midst of your trials. If you really want to know, James 1 says he'll, he'll, he'll tell you, just ask. But here's, what, here's the thing. Most of the time you can't understand what, what it was for. Why? Because you don't know what five years from now looks like. And he's not going to be able to tell you God's great answer to Job. Job, I'd tell you, but you couldn't understand it. So I'm not going to tell you. Job, I was all over when we were forming the world. I didn't see you there. So I'm thinking you don't even have the requisite knowledge to understand the answer when I give it to you. God's real answer to human suffering. I'd tell you, but you wouldn't understand how it works in my plan. All I can tell you is this is who I am, and the story is not about anything else. It's me weaving step by step a tapestry of this is who I am. If everybody's saved, then I am not just. If everybody's lost, then I am not gracious. So I'm going to put together the most complicated story ever to tell you who I am. Why? Because there's nobody like me. And that's what God does. It says that that God was training him. I, I'm sitting here in the first verse and I'm realizing that he was at the river Chabar among the exiles and the heavens were open. Can I just make a point? He didn't find God. God found him. God opened the heavens. You know, the, the strident stride of a fully developed Pharisaic mind in the Apostle Paul walked on to the road to Damascus, but by the end he's being led because he's blind. You know why? Because God struck him blind so he could see. Because sometimes the only way to get a person to have any spiritual sight is to take away their physical sight. Sometimes what God has to do is chop the legs out from underneath of you to teach you how to walk. And so there was preparation involved in it. And what's interesting is, if you keep reading, verse 2 says, on the fifth of the month of the fifth year of King Yehoiachin's exile, the Lord, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Butzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Chabar River. And there was the hand of the Lord that came upon him. It's, it's worth noting in the book that the word of the Lord is mentioned about 50 times in the book. And where the hand of the Lord is mentioned, I always want you to look. Wherever you see that in the book, it's not the same as the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is about, I want you to know something. The hand of the Lord is, I want to move you. That's the hand of the Lord. When the hand of the Lord is upon you, it's kind of, it's, I don't want to say it's as tough as this, but it's reminiscent of the foot of Russ Smith, my dad. When the foot of Russ Smith, my dad, was upon you, it was to move. Okay? The word of Russ was to hear. I don't know if you grew up in a house like this, but when you got 15 kids, my dad called discipline crowd control. <laughs> did, you ever, did this happen to you? We went to church, we'd sit there. You know, first of all, we had this 40 Conline van. It was a panel van with no windows. So we, we, we would pull up at the church and we'd come out looking like SWAT with Bibles. Jump, 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 you know. And so we'd come visit your church and your church would go up by 10% in attendance. And, and, but we had this long, long pew, you know, and there I was sitting in the pew, and my father had a, a way of dealing with us. It was like, you all know what this is? You're like down there, <laughs> somebody drops a hymn book. That's... Dad never moved. He's looking at the preacher. He just goes, this means I am going to tolerate this. This finger means... If the other finger happens to join it, you probably won't live till tonight. So you don't want the other finger to go like this. 
This is the finger of death. <laughs> this one means you're not even going to make it to the car. <laughs> I never did get to the third one. I never did get to the third one. But I will tell you this. Those symbols were important to me. I knew not just the, the word of my dad, I knew the hand of my dad. So when you read this, I want you to read that beyond preparation, there was also consecration. Consecration is not a word we use a lot. The consecration principle is that the work of the Lord is entrusted to those who are called by God, and they have to know their call. Can I suggest to you that other people confirm your call, but God gives it? Uh, Don Yuri was my professor in pastoral affairs. Um, I failed preaching one. You won't be surprised when you hear me preach. But the truth of the matter is I learned a great deal from that man. And here's the line that he said that never, ever left me. Men, be sure of your calling. It will be more important to you than your work. Now let me tell you why that's important. Because when God calls you to be in Jerusalem and the bullets are flying in your house, you do what God called you to do. I don't mean you don't duck. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's going well, if it's what God told you to do. What does how it's going have to do with your call? And I have lived now 30 years of ministry watching God called me to teach his word. And it doesn't matter if people want to hear it, and it doesn't matter if they like what they hear, it matters that I do it as unto an audience of one. Because I can tell you something. I've been, in the, I've been in my car when the whole room was happy at what they heard and Jesus wasn't happy and he let me know. Lord, I was just, you know, I was just having a little fun. You were using my pulpit for your laughs. Listen to me, son. I gave you your call and I know what I want you to do. In Yorkshire, England, during the 1800s, two sons were born to a family named Taylor. The one set out to make a name for himself by uh, entering parliament. He gained great public prestige. But the younger son said, you know, I'm not going to do that. He gave his heart to Jesus Christ. He later recalled, I, I do remember in an, in an unreserved consecration, I put myself, my life, my friends, my all upon the altar. I felt that I was in the presence of God, entering into a covenant with the Almighty. With that commitment, Hudson Taylor turned his face toward China and supposed obscurity. As a result, he's known and honored on every continent as a faithful missionary and the founder of the China Inland Mission, now known as Overseas Missionary Fellowship. The other son, by the way, there's no lasting monument to him. The one you will see says the brother of Hudson Taylor. A man who wants to preserve his life will lose it. And the one who lays it down for my sake, the one who consecrates, hands over to me, that guy I'm going to use. You want to turn the head of God? You, you don't need to be Billy Graham to turn the head of God. You need to be Abraham to turn the head of God. A guy who's just out there with sheep and goats and camels on a hillside who says, you know what, God, when you speak, I'll take you seriously. You tell me I'm going to have a kid, I'll build a nursery. I, I looked at Sarah. She's not looking like a spring chicken, and neither am I. But we'll put our teeth back in and <laughs> give it the old college try. And we'll just wait for whatever. So what I see is that there's a consecration involved in it. He says, the hand of the Lord came upon... Listen, what's missing in our pulpits is very simple. God isn't speaking to the man, so the man can only echo them and mimic somebody else's words to you. Because their, their schedule is jammed with meetings instead of jammed with the one meeting they need to have to speak from the fire of the altar of God. And without that meeting, we're all starving. I need, I need to know that, that my preacher is going to have been on his knees and God is going to speak to his heart. And it is the easiest thing to fake you've ever seen. And then you get to verse 4. It says, 
As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and bright light around it, and in the midst of something like glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Just like Isaiah 6 and Habakkuk 3 and Jeremiah 4 and Nahum 1, God's judgment was displayed in a storm, the ruach, the, the breath, the wind that comes with a storm. Now, I, I know you've got some storms, but this is storm season for us. It, it's storm season in Florida. The largest company in Florida, the, the doors got ripped off Wednesday night. They just flew right off. Building full of people. The doors flew right off. Incredible wind. The Hebrew terminology for the normal invasion into the land was a storm. I, I want you to understand when God appears, he invades. God knows how to make an entrance. And when he shows up, he invades. Because this territory is still occupied by the prince of the power of the air. God invaded the story. And by the way, in verse 4, what you're going to see is the immense power of God because you cannot, you cannot, you will not effectively serve God if you do not understand his power. I, I, I spent my week dealing with sinners. I got two marriages that I'm hoping will make the week. Got a young man over, caught in a, in a horrible molestation. And, and here's the thing. If, if I thought the power was in counseling, I'd quit now. Have, have, my brother ran an addiction center. Do you know what the uh, recidivism rate is in an addiction center sponsored by the state of Florida? Nine out of ten of those people are going to be back. This is the high level to which I can delicately hold the power of counseling. It doesn't hardly work! You think that I'm going to give the, the power of God over to some human council of people and let them figure out how we're going to get out of this? This nation doesn't have a problem that God can't solve. It doesn't want him to. Scientists say a typical lightning bolt bridges a potential difference voltage of 700 million volts. A famous strike just before Apollo 15 launch in 1971 was measured at 100,000 amps by magnetic links to the umbilical tower. Currents of over 200,000 amps have been reported. Just so you're doing the calculation, one lightning strike in the state of Florida could have powered 10 million homes for one month. That's just one. You want to talk to me about God being strong? You want to sit back and go, well, I don't know if he can deal with my problems. This guy met God, and he met him in a powerful storm. And, and, and here's what he saw. I, I can't do it justice. Look at verse 5. Within it there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had a human form. You know what? God, God likes the form that he made people in. He, he likes our bodies. At the previous World 1.0, he had human forms. Now, they had some interesting characteristics. I think I'd like wings. How about you? But, but here's what it says. Each of them had four faces. Well, you know, we've mastered the art at two faces, but I don't know that most of us can do four. So these, they're, they're four, the, the four wings are different than the seraphim that have six wings, but, but that's because the seraphim do flying. Cherubim are actually wheeled. Interestingly enough, did you know that Daniel 7 says that God moves on wheels? God, God is, moves on a wheeled chariot, and around him are the kruvim, the cherubim, and they are wheeled. It's the seraphim that are doing the flying. So, so it literally says that the four wings uh, of the seraphim are different than these, uh, you know, are, are different than these, but it says, look at verse 7. Their wings were straight, and their feet were like calves' hooves. They gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings and on the four sides were human hands. As for the faces and wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Stop right there. The, the wings had a purpose that wasn't only to move. It was to connect them. One of the things I want you to know about God's word is all the way through it, God is relational and God is connected. 
Where the enemy comes, people are divided. Where God comes into the room, he connects. And these moved in constant connection. This was a guy who was a priest. He knew that if he saw the tapestry, those wings were connected. But now he's seeing the real thing, not the picture. And guess what? They're connected. Because what Bezalel was told when he made the tabernacle was, do it like it really is in heavenly places. And there they were. And then it says, verse, verse 9, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved. Each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man, had the face of a lion. Each had the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread about above. Each had two touching one another, another being, and two covering their bodies. They each went straight forward. Wherever the Spirit was to go, they would go, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something that looked like burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth along, uh, among the living beings. The fire was bright, the lightning was flashing from fire, and the living beings ran to and fro with bolts of lightning. Here's what I want you to see. The Spirit of God was coming forward and these four living creatures are going before God and their life, their movement wasn't their choice. What do you suppose this priest who's being trained to be a prophet is learning? The living creatures that stand before God's throne don't decide, hey, that's looking good, let's go over that way. That's not how it works. Where the Spirit directs, the, the creatures move. Now pray as in heaven, so on earth. That our lives today wouldn't be, here's my day timer, God, in Jesus' name, amen. How about, what am I doing today, God? Where's your spirit taking me today? The most important hospital visit I made this week was to somebody I didn't know and didn't know I was going to see. Because they were in the bed next to the person who was lost that I was supposed to see. You walk into the room. I don't know if this happens in Ohio. Let me just say this for Florida. We lose a lot of patients. They come back eventually, but they went to a test somewhere, and they're in a hallway. And six, seven, eight hours later, somebody goes, hey, where's John Jones? I don't know. And then they go looking for him. I walk into the room. Oh, yeah, he's there. There's no tests. I walk in. The bed's empty. So I'm standing there, and my schedule is jammed. I mean, I, this is ridiculous. And I said, Lord, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? next to him. you a preacher yes sir I am can you talk to me that's why I came pull up a chair captive audience opportunity to talk to a guy who is about to face the end of his life and for the first time thought you know maybe that eternity thing I ought to get that worked out here's the thing your most important appointment isn't the one you wrote in the book. It's the one God already has there, but you're overwriting with a bunch of stuff and then asking God to bless what you put. L look at these wheels. I, I, I was fascinated by the wheels because the cherubim are cool, but the wheels are really cool. It says in verse 15, that now as I looked at these living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings for each one of the four of them. Did you notice that? There are wheels, but one of them touches earth. You know why? Because part of what God is doing is here, but not all of it. Don't get the idea that God is some dysfunctional God sitting up in the heavens pining over whether or not Americans like him now or not. He's not a dysfunctional person. God is who he is. In the beginning, God. Believe it, don't, I'm still God. I don't know another way to say this. I, I walk into a university classroom and they mock the idea that there's a God and I look at him and go, here's the bottom line. Everybody in the room still is going to face a six-foot hole. What happens next? You can guess the way you want to, but I'm taking care of mine before I get there. Why? Because I happen to know somebody who came back out. And you can call it a mystery if you want. 
but it's not a mystery to me. And you can mock the idea that there is a God and somehow decide that your life is made up of a world that was created by nothing for no reason going nowhere and out of that derive some happiness if you want to try. I recommend drugs. <laughs> I think that's probably going to be your best bet. Because I got to tell you, I don't know how people get up in the morning and don't know God and get through the day. Right. Here's the thing. It says, it's worth noting that the wheels not only move the creatures about, I mean, wheels do move pe creatures, but, but they left an impact on the physical realm, from the spiritual realm to the physical realm, from world 1.0 to world 2.0. Every now and then they touch. Remember this, you are hardware and software. The hardware is the body. It ages. Can I get an amen? Yeah. It ages. The software doesn't age. You take software, you put it on a disc, you throw it in a drawer, you pull it out 10 years from then, put the game in, and the people are not like walking with walkers and got older while it was in there. <laughs> that which has mass has time. Angels are massless until they break into this world. And by the way, they don't get us. They don't get us. Zacharias is standing there, he's preparing the incense because he's going to offer the prayers of the people, which is ridiculous because he's the one guy in the whole group that God never listened to his prayer. Begged God for a son. God didn't listen. And he gets the lot falling on him, and he's going in there going, all right, I'll bring the prayers of Israel. That's going to work. <laughs> and he's standing there doing that, and all of a sudden, poof, here comes Gabe. And Gabriel says, God heard your prayer. <laughs> yeah, great. You take a good look at Liz recently. <laughs> and then he says, you're going to have a son. Yeah, how's that going to happen? I'm thinking he's looked at himself recently. <laughs> and here's the thing. Here's what Gabriel says to him, and I think this is great. A great view from the angelic world. Gabriel looks at him and goes, I work for God. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I work for God. When God speaks, it happens. What's wrong with you? I think angels don't get us. I think they don't have sex, so they don't really understand why that's so like all-consuming in our culture. And I think that they really don't understand our disbelief. Because they go into heaven and they see God and then they come back and they take a look at us and go, that's what you got out of all that? Are you kidding me? And we call on angels to be in our churches and they're sitting on the back pew horrified. This is what you're doing? Look at 16. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling barrel and, and all four of them had the same form, their appearance and their workmanship being as one wheel was, was within another. This is a reference to either a gyroscope or I think it's actually a gear system. It's a very tough Hebrew passage. But I think what you're seeing is these four living creatures always face forward. Their back is always to God. Their face is always to where the Spirit is directing them to go. Some of you know this, but after Douglas MacArthur took over J Japan uh, for the uh, Allied forces, 1,500 Japanese soldiers lined the road from the time he landed and stood there with arms. And as his car drove past, they turned to their back so as to honor him by putting their back to him. The idea, the, the Eastern idea of honor is that you don't look at them. And so what you have are these guys, these four living creatures, and they're on wheels that are opposed to one another that move in every direction, but they never actually change their perspective. They can go in all the planes, but they're always facing in the same direction. And there are these wheels, 
and you think, wow, that's really cool. They're facing us. They never turn to the side. They always are facing us. But look at verse 18. As for their rims, they were lofty and awesome. And as for the rims, all four of them were full of eyes round about. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them also. And wherever the living beings rose from the earth, the wheels rose also. Don't you dare get the idea that God is riding along blind in history. He's got eyes before, behind, and in every direction. And the Spirit of God is feeding information to those, those living beings going before the moving God of His throne who is omniscient and there's nothing He doesn't see. That ought to make you comfortable if you're suffering and uncomfortable if you're sinning. Because He doesn't miss any. And all the way around as he moves forward, look at the direction in verse 20. Whenever the Spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close behind him, and the spirits of the living beings was in the wheels. The connection was not spokes, it was the living Spirit of God. God's Spirit connecting together giving information, pushing them forward. But I want you to go to verse 12. I want you to notice that the whole fixation he had on these incredible living beings wasn't the thing. Look what happened. Now, over the heads of the living beings, there was something like an expanse, like a gleam of crystal spread over their heads. Under the expanse, their wings were stretched out toward one another. Each one had two wings covering its body on one side and on the other. And, it, and what's interesting is, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of abundant waters as they went, like the voice of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army camp. Whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings, and there came a voice above the expanse. If you're used to marking in your Bible, look at where God's voice comes from. It comes from the top. Here's the glory of the vision, but God's above them all. Here's the expanse, but God's above the expanse. There isn't anybody above God. He's not wrestling against evil. It's not dualism and darkness versus light. It's when God speaks, the entire universe listens. And only those who desire to rebel can do so until he says, Stop. We're not wrestling against an enemy that has an eternity to fight against God. He's on a leash. When God tugs that leash, it's over. See, in verses 24 and 25, God's the director. There came a voice, verse 25, from above the expanse that was over their heads, and whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. God's glorious voice is described the way Revelation 1 and Revelation 19 describe it. Look at verse 26. God is the ruler. Above the expanse there was one over their heads that was something resembling a throne. Why? Because a throne is where a ruler sits. God's in charge. Why does he need this? Because false prophets are yakety yak. He needs to know God is in charge. And if it's happening, it's because God said it can happen. I sit with people who are hurting. And I say to them, if God put the song of cancer in your life. And that's the song you sing. Does he have the right to harm my body? Does he have the right to take away my job? Does he have the right to put in my hands a child and then take that child away? Ladies and gentlemen, if he doesn't, he owes an apology to martyrs. Or he's God and he owes an apology to no one. Why? Because his story is his story. Look at the awesome appearance of God, verse 27. It comes in like glowing metal. I saw something, verse, end of verse 27, I saw something like fire and there was radiance about him. Let me just simply summarize this by saying God made an incredible presentation. He walked in and he showed himself. And do you know why he did that? Because no man can serve a God he does not worship. That man must believe in the power and benevolence to such an extent that no other following deserves his full attention. 
if such a belief is going to change the very path of his life, he has to know that God before he can preach that God. You can't give away what you don't have. You can't give away. The depth of the testimony of God will be found in the person who's been broken deeply. By the way, Ezekiel knew he could trust God. He wasn't the only one. You, you remember this. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, For this reason I also suffer many things. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard that which I have entrusted to him against that day. Retain the standard of sound words, Tim, that you heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who, who goes before us the treasure of that which has been entrusted to you. I need to wrap this up, and so I want to do it this way. First, search the whole of the scriptures, and you will not find anyone God is asking to figure out something to do next. God already has a plan. My job is to follow it, not... My job is to find it, then follow it, not create it. Okay? I tell my students every year at the beginning of class, I've taken 12 of you. We're going to study 1,189 chapters, and it's going to be hard. If you don't want to do it, get up out of the seat now, because somebody else wants your spot. This isn't Sunday school, and I'm not playing games. Here's the bottom line. If you want this bad enough, seek God on your face for the answer to one question. I'm here. Why? What am I doing here? What would you make me for? Why me? Why my broken home? Why my dysfunctional mom? My, why my... What am I supposed to be doing with what you gave me? The second thing I would say is that God often calls a man or woman as a platform to share his plan. You see, he's calling Ezekiel because he's about to tell the nation what he's going to do. He called Noah because he was about to tell people what rain looked like. The point is he calls the man so he can grab the message. Third, God can use you when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Let me, let me finish with this. You know, John's at Patmos. He's under arrest. This is not a highlight of his Christian experience. He's in the spirit on the Lord's day, bowing before God, and God breaks open the book of Revelation. How many of you are glad he had that day? But he thought he was on a shelf. Paul's in a house arrest, sitting near the Tiber River in a place that stinks of urine and sulfur. And he's thinking, oh, man, I've gone 10,000 miles for Jesus. The churches are in trouble. What am I doing here? And God gives him Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon. Aren't you glad he was under arrest? a girl named Rachel Rosenblum. She was in a concentration camp. She was a Jew. Her mother had died. Her father had died. Her two sisters and her were split up, but in the same camp. They could occasionally see one another. She was in a, a barracks, lying on a wood platform, huddled up against 10 other women. <coughs> For one whole day, the Germans never walked in and opened the door, and everybody began to wonder what was happening. Were they going to starve them to death? Most of them were pretty weak already, and they thought, well, maybe they're just going to stop feeding us now. On the second day, there was, a, there was a banging and a sound of a clanging and some tumult outside, and then the door opened up, and the light was so strong, it hit the eyes of the women. They covered their faces. And there was an American GI standing at the door. This is a true story. And the young man looked at them and said, ladies, come on out. And he helped one old woman out and took her out the door. And then another. Rachel was all the way down the end, so she was the last to get out. And when she got out, he, he grabbed her by the hand and he went over. But by now the door had closed and she, he said, excuse me, ma'am. And he opened the door, and she said, after you. And Rachel began to cry. Because it had been so long since anyone acknowledged that she was a woman, and so long since anyone had said the word ma'am to her. 
And she began to sob and to cry. And this young GI put his arm around this young lady who was nothing but skin and bones and walked her out, got her something to drink. About seven months later, that GI heard from Rachel, and about three years later, they became man and wife. Here's the truth. At the darkest moment in her, of her life, God was opening the brightest door she would ever see. She didn't know it was coming. The thing is, God has the right to invade your life, and he will generally do it when you are least expecting it and often do it when you are most in pain. That's just the truth. Okay? Let's take a break.